Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Datu's Corner Live. Today is a special time uh, due to the fact I had a bunch of errands I had to run and I couldn't uh, reschedule. So I hope everyone had a good weekend uh, this past weekend. It was Mother's Day, so I hope all you mothers out there had a good weekend. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Um, as usual, if you are watching this on other platforms, um, this is being live broadcasted over to um, YouTube. So um, hopefully everyone, please, if you get a chance, will you like the channel, subscribe, hit the notification button, and please feel sure to share to share any of these videos wherever you feel is appropriate. So um, how did everyone everyone have a good time this weekend? Uh, everyone have a good Mother's Day? Uh, spend time with your significant other or your mom um, or whomever, you know. I, um, I'm uh, just getting the c computer set up on my side. I rolled in very last minute, um, had some... Uh, Shipping issues with an order of rattan I'm trying to get out, which is being frustrating. But that's okay. I do what I do. So, um, shout out if you're here. Uh, I see a few people have logged in here. Um, I got some viewers here and there on a bunch of our different platforms. Um, today's topic is, uh, well, it started to be controversial from the moment I mentioned it, um, <laughs> which I, I thought was a little off, um, on how, uh, how people were getting so intense at, uh, such a, uh, such a quick thing. Hello, Scott. How are we doing today? Um, so Basically, today's topic on Datu's Corner, uh, good afternoon to Mr. Larry as well, um, we're going over Americanized Filipino martial arts. Is it better, the same, worse than the original system? And what the heck do I mean by Americanized Filipino martial arts? If it's Filipino, why wouldn't it just be Filipino martial arts? Well... I, and I use the term Americanized um, because I think that's uh, important to make a distinction. Like, um, so I'm going to say something that's really not, shouldn't be controversial, but it has a tendency of being it. Is there truly a thing called Brazilian Jiu Jitsu? In my opinion, no. Jiu Jitsu is a Japanese word. Um, the Brazilians did their version, their flair, added their flair to the ground element of judo. Now, for those who aren't familiar with the whole thing, judo came about when jiu-jitsu people wanted to play, they did judo. So uh, the Brazilians learned the judo, but from what I understand, just the uh, just the ground element. Now, I've been doing Brazilian jiu-jitsu off and on since the 90s. Um Still have my white belt. <laughs> Still keep working on it. But I have a few stripes, you know. I get a little uh, sidetracked every now and then. Um, and one of the people I work with is a teacher up in Canada. And right now, pfft, we know that's not going to happen. Um, no chance of um, training up there at the moment because, well, I can't get there. But uh, nonetheless, let's get into... Uh, Let's get into today's topic. So, um, uh, Brazilian, I mean, uh, Americanized Arnis. So, um, first of all, let's talk about a martial arts. As a martial art, what influences martial arts? You know, so when it comes to the creation of a system, <laughs> uh, well, we're not getting into that right now. Um, uh, next week, we'll talk about that. So next week is going to the Philippines. Is it a training necessity or a waste of time and effort? We'll talk about that later. Um, the, the thing here is when you create a martial art, when a martial art has been created, it has to do with the environment that it was created in, the, ge the geography, uh, the climate, which is usually a factor of geography, 
and uh, the genealogy of the people doing it. So when we take Filipino martial arts, they were taught in the Philippines, which is a jungle. And I've heard a bunch of people that there's no nothing to change. There's no need to change any of that. But I disagree. When you change the environment, certain factors go. Like So for those who did American karate, um, when things came from the main or went from Hawaii to the mainland, they dealt with something that they weren't used to dealing with. And that was being in a part of the world that would actually wear jackets. Uh, the climate was significantly different. You know, um, when you think about Filipino martial arts and Polynesian martial arts and the and and Hawaii, you think of a bunch of people walking around with sarongs, loincloths, or whatever, very minimalistic clothing because the climate really you didn't need to wear layers. Now I live in Buffalo, New York, so I am ten minutes from the Canadian border. I'm thirty minutes south of Niagara Falls. Um, I've had people comment about my physical expression of the Filipino martial arts because I, uh, and as well as my boxing, it's like, oh, you're pretty flat footed. Well, I don't box for the ring. I box for the street. Okay. Um, let's see here. I only see most of the eagle from the Philippines lines here. Okay. All right. All right. I hear what you're saying. But once again, this is not what we're talking about at the moment. We're not doing comparison of the system at the moment that way. Um, that'll be next week. So um, the the big thing that... Um, okay. Uh, just got a little sidetracked. My bad. Um, when we're doing this... We talk about what we're doing. It is geared for the people in a certain environment. Now, to me, I and mean, I've talked to this time and time again, soldiering is soldiering. Everyone goes to the same basic boot camp, but then you go to specialty schools based on the environment that you're going to be in. Yep, you got to definitely put it on your schedule next week. Um, so When you go to the military and after you do your basic boot camp, from there, you might go into training for the jungle. So you have jungle troops. You have desert troops. We have urban combat. We have Arctic. We have amphibious. Now, the core elements of soldiering is still the same throughout all that. But you they made modifications to best fit the environment that it was going to be done in. And that's the same thing I look with any martial art, not just Filipino martial arts, all martial arts. So when you take a foreign martial art and transplant it into another country, modifications need to be made. You know, um, part of it was the mindset of the instructors, you know. So we had a culture clash, you know, when we're dealing with the Asian, Asian instructors, you know, um, we would ask, as Americans, I know, okay, so tell me if Tell me if anyone else has done this. When I was a kid, I had two piles of toys. Pile one was the pile that I would tear apart, put back together, tear apart, put back together. Pile two was the toys that I tore apart and couldn't figure out how to put back together. Because we, as a culture, we try to see how things work. Am I the only one that did that? Or have other people done similar things? You know, we're, um, we're some of the best to toys I've ever had. Legos, uh, Lincoln Logs, stuff of that name, Erector sets, because we like putting things together and tearing it apart. Am I the only one? I know there's a lag. So, um, so when we ask the Asians instructors, when they first came over here, there was that culture clash where people didn't understand where we were coming from. And it was never about questioning authority. It was wondering how it was inquisitive. It was a seek to search. It was a search of knowledge, um, not necessarily thinking, Hey, this stuff doesn't work. I mean, I remember asking professor a lot of types. Yep. You feel that great. I'm glad. I'm glad. 
Um, hopefully someone other than Romeo is going to chime in. I don't know where Chris Davison is. He's usually stalking by now. Maybe the maybe the fact that we're doing this at 1 o'clock, uh, this episode, is is taking things a little different. So, um, so you know, um, when you move things here, so, like, I'm in Buffalo. It's slippery all year, which means it could be rain. It could be snow, sleet. It could be a frost. You could be at a – I mean, I've gone out and about clubbing back in the day. And anyone who's ever gone out to the clubs know that the, the floors are a bloody mess. They're either very sticky from semi-dried drinks or they're very slippery from recently dry uh, um, spilled drinks. So when it comes to my combat, I, I you know, and I've always do my application for the street. You know, when I, when it comes to working the combatives, now I do things for martial art, I do things for martial sport, I do it for martial combat, and you know, or fitness, form, and function. You know, fitness, the physical attributes, form, technical precision, function, what's going to work. I do all these things, and I'm looking because I have shipments coming in today. I do all these things, but I, I, I got to know what I'm doing at that moment. Like if I'm doing a drill for speed, I got to realize that that ain't fighting. But better speed could help me in a combative situation. If I'm working an endurance drill, once again, that's not fighting. But as we all know, having better endurance in combative scenarios would definitely help out a lot. Let's see here. John has a lot of ground foot, grounding footwork. Very important. Uh, ring of sport are different. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. And I have no problem with any of that. Now, that brings up a good point. Like, I have some people who are um, talking about, well, you know, it doesn't always have to work. You're right. It doesn't. It could. It, we could be doing things to have fun. We can do things to build attributes. It could be a, um, it could be a, um, um, you know, study of movement, uh, position recognition. But if we are promoting specifically combatives and we're selling attributes or fancy drills on that, that's the problem. Like I said, I, I think. I don't know. I see a lot of stuff, and I get very frustrated in the industry because I watch all these videos, and um, you know, um, people are telling me different things, and I'm like, "Do you really know what you're talking about? Have you ever been in a fight? Am I maybe not getting what you're trying to do? And maybe it's me. Maybe I didn't. Maybe I didn't hear the beginning of what they were saying. Maybe I didn't hear the full extent of what they were promoting. Um, you know, there's a lot of different things going on out there." And um, here we go. Yep, it's exactly having enhanced attributes are are definitely better than not having them all. But if someone is selling the attributes as combatives, that's where the problem is. You know, um, I love doing sinwalis. I love doing sombrada drills. I love doing all of the things that I do, which is a huge, huge things that. I, a huge repertoire of all the different things I'm training. But I know what I'm doing when I'm doing it. And there's there's the problem, you know, do we? But now we digress. So let's get back into the main thing, Americanized Filipino martial arts or uh, Philam, M- F-A-M-A, which is what I'm promoting now, uh, Filipino-American martial arts. Um, what are the differences so first of all, you know, and I look at it, I don't want to say even Americanized. I don't think that's necessarily the the right comment. It's because it could be, uh, there could be a British version of this and an, and an English or a, a German version. Actually, I know there's a German version of this. Um, you can have all these different versions based on the country you're in because you, you, you do things, you know. When you, uh, you know, when you have Americanized food, you know, where it's, you know, it's taken from another country with an Americanized twist on it. Um, so why wouldn't our martial arts be the same? Well, first of all, like I said, when I'm teaching here, I'm doing a lot of things that I normally wouldn't do. Um, oh, see, John. Yep. Sometimes things are lost in translation, you know. Um, 
So when I go through things, I hate wearing these earbuds. Um, yep. Okay, there you go. So um, what is different training here than in the Philippines? Let's, let's go that route. So in most cases, there's usually not a there's usually not a language barrier, as John just pointed out. A lot of things are lost in translation. You know, when I talked to Professor Praces, who was my primary Filipino martial arts instructor, I would ask him a question multiple times because I don't necessarily un- re- think he realized what I was saying. So you got to remember, like, okay, let's, let's talk about Professor. He. Uh, English was his fourth language. So if you talk to him in English, he would have to think about what you told him and then translate it to what whatever his primary, I think the sign was his primary, or whatever he was thinking about at the moment, because who knows what he identified with most. Um, and then tr- come up with an answer and translate it back. There's a lot of translations going on there, and you lose something in the in that process. So I would ask, professor would tell a story. Well, I would, he, he would tell the story for years. And, you know, every year, another piece of the story came out. And another piece. And another piece. You know, I remember it started off with him. How? Oh, oh, I, 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 uh, my uncle's place. I, um, I wanted to see my uncle. And I took out a security guard with a newspaper. That's all I had. Well, then later... Uh, it turns out that he had a lead pipe in the newspaper, but the first few years, that all was part left out. And then there's all the extra little pieces that, that got in there. So, you know, when you ask, when you ask someone from your own country an answer, as long as they know it, and that's the thing, they may still not know it, they can give you that answer. They can come right off and say, boom, this is it. So you don't have that translation um, mishap. But then again, if we're talking Filipinos teaching Filipinos, we shouldn't have an issue. There's a, there's also, though, an educational system problem. So now this is not going to be a popular comment, and I want everyone to listen closely when I say this. I don't think the Philippines have a bad educational system. The problem with the Philippines is not everyone has access to that Filipino, that, that education system. And you'll hear people like Grandmaster Bobby Tomata who is smart as all heck. But he tells you he only did four years of school because you have to pay for school after a certain point. And a lot of people can't afford it. There's loads of people living in the streets. And, you know, why here in the States, why do we get things? Because there are a thing called taxes and and they keep raising our school taxes. It's just crazy, especially when they had a year off school. But that's another topic. Not for this discussion, though. Um, You know, we, we look at these things, and ultimately, um, you know, when you don't have access to that educational system, you don't see how structured. Like, I mean, I graduated high school. That's all I did. I'll be the first to admit that. But I continued my education, even to this day. So in the jobs that I, that I had over the years before I did martial arts, I, um, I had continuing education in those departments. So, you know, I work for Advanced Auto Parts, so we're constantly learning things about the automotive systems and how things work, how the systems work, and that's important. How to systemize things, very important. Um, what I've also done is I've continued my education when it comes to, um, you know, right now, I, I know... a. Compared to the average person walking around, average person, I know so much more about social media marketing, how to run the businesses, and stuff of that nature. Uh, you know, video editing, Just keep, we can keep going on. Work, graphic design. Now, I am nowhere near as proficient as someone who specializes in it, but the average person walking around doesn't... Um, doesn't have um, the quantity of knowledge, the diversity of knowledge that I have in those fields. Now, these are all things that I use for my business. So I do continued education. So I do continuing education in 
my martial art field, learning other systems. And I also look into the business thing. And, and the thing here is systemizing things and logical progressions. And I don't think the Filipinos had that. Um, professor was very slick. I got to tell you, he was, I mean, as far as a Filipino went, and I'm saying uh, someone from the Philippines teaching martial arts, um, man, I mean, he was, he was more organized than all the others that I've seen. Um, but, he was lacking. I mean, he was only human. Um, but you know, things that you'll see over here, like John just brought up is a curriculum. And, um, since we, since we're talking about that, I'm going to pull up some stuff here that, um, it may take a moment. So we'll talk. Well, I'll continue talking while I do things. So I'm looking over at this other screen, prepping things for my, um, for to to lay things out you know um we'll come back into that in a moment but like you know so they they won't have the education as a whole uh they they didn't have the whole idea of progressions when i started teaching over in europe um the compliment i got from the uh, europeans you know and they were telling me compared to the filipinos because they're used to the Filipinos coming over from the islands and teaching. They didn't have that direct, direct access that we did here in the States. Um, you know, they're like, wow, you're, you're pretty organized. I mean, you know, you're, I'm not used to these progressions being laid out that way. So um, I had a whole bunch of things like, okay, I would teach block check counter. Then I would teach block check counter into obstruction removal. Then I would, and I, you know, and I would do more advanced techniques. It wasn't just, I'm not using, you know, um, a lot of it, what I would do is the Balintwak roots, the advanced tappy tappy as we, uh, as we go from there. But, um, okay, here we go. Perfect. 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 So, um, and this is a benefit of my Western education system. And, you know, when I talk to the Filipinos, there's inconsistency in nomenclature because, well, I don't know if they even know their own language. Um, and I'm not saying that in a bad way, but when you've got 7,200 islands and the last, uh, last thing I found, which I don't know how accurate it is, was that there was around 140 dialects. It's very hard to, to hard to be consistent with, uh, with, with things when you have too many people speaking too many different languages and, you know, Case in point, I'm going to use Remy as an example and his own kids. So Remy went and studied Balintawak with Anchan Bakan. Uh, he, he he studied with, a, he got brought in by a few other people, um, Maranga and uh, Mongkal. And I'm not sure which of the order it was. And eventually he was passed up to work with Anchan. Um and the first thing you learn, so I, I study with Ted Buat, or I did before he passed on. So Ted Buat was a, um, um, was, he would teach for Anchon when he wasn't in the club. So he taught, he was probably the leading, now this is not Sam Buat, because a lot of people get confused. Ted Buat um, was probably the leading expert on Anchon's original system. The modified system you see out there, Jose Villason was one that developed the, the grouping systems and others took it on from that point. But Remy was there. So he was in Cebu and they have a different language over there. And um, yes, and in the Cebuano method. So there were some language issues. So there's the thing called the AB scenario. A, B, C, D, A, R, E, O. A, B, C, D, E, or E. That's off the top of my head. Uh, it's A, B, C's. One, two, three. It'll even say it that way. And that's how it's produced. A, B, C, D, A, R, E, O. But now, Remy's kids or someone, they had, they had somebody, you can see it on online. They've relabeled the uh, series that he did. He calls it. Visadario, V with Visadario with a V. No, it's A B Sidario. Even the old family couldn't understand. Remy would actually tell stories about how we would go to cousins one village over and have some big linguistics debacle because they the language was similar but off just a little bit. I mean, he was in Negros. There was two parts of the island, Negros Occidental 
and Negros Oriental. You know, so by Dumaguetes in Oriental and on the Bacolo and uh, Negran, which is where he lived, that's on the Occidental side. So if Remy would go visit family members and have issues, and even in this case, he his own kids misunderstood what he was saying. You know, um, you know, you can see where there might be some challenges. So I, this thing is not about the quality of what you're learning, because that'll be another conversation. Um, that'll be next week's conversation, you know. Um, but the things about what makes Americanized or, or German or English and, you know, so on and so forth uh, different, and you be the judge whether you think it's better or not. So what I'm going to do is share here. I have something that people don't have. It's called a written curriculum. So I started with a written curriculum. So right off the bat, I, I divided up in subsections just so people have a structure. So uh, mano, mano, and kuntao means all your basic open hand striking and trapping. Panatukin is our boxing. Sikran is uh, the kicking portion. Now, uh, I'm certified in these. I'm not, I'm not just pulling these out of the top of the hat. But that, then again, I'm also telling people that we use these sections as generic terminology. Dumag, any of our locks and controls. We have our self-defense scenario section. Anyos, which are our uh, patterns, our forms. And then Sandata, all of our weapon training. Every belt has it. Now, in this case, yellow belt has a secondary sheet, which will give you some basic terms. Um, a numbering system, so you know how to count. How the sin wallers are done. What are the angles of attack? The left side of this and the right side of this. Okay. Now, uh, I used to have them for every belt level. I am scrapped that for a while. I'm getting back into it. So, um, you know, these are things that I've, I, my first instructor had this all laid out well in advance. And I continued developing it. And it's nowhere near where it used to be, but it did start from my initial instructor, John Bryant. So I have a written curriculum. We've got, um, these are just hopeless placeholders right now. We have it flushed out to third degree. I've got material up to fifth. We do a belting system. Not all systems do, but we do. And you don't need to. I'm just saying that's that's what that's what we're doing. You know, um, These are things that I find that are different than the Filipino version of that. As a Westerner, well, actually... As a student, and it could be because it's a Westerner, I like to have a direction. Professor didn't have a written curriculum per se. He had the test that we all took. Everybody took the same test at camp. He knew the core material you need to have, and it was a combination of knowing the material and physical proficiency. And every time I tested, I would act, I would actually ask him, what you know, what do I need to work on for my next promotion? And once I was like, well, you know, you just got promoted. I go, professor, I don't care how long it takes. I mean, what do you, th I mean, I look as a, I look as a test, as a job review, a performance review. So, you know, when you go to work and someone gives you, they don't just sit there and say, okay, uh, you didn't get a raise. See you later. Bye. Or we're giving you a raise. What a, what a good person should be doing. A good boss should be saying, Hey, this is what your strengths are. There's your weaknesses. I want you to work on this in the meantime for your next review. Okay, and that's how I looked on my belt promotions. I went up quicker than anyone else that I know of. Uh, but then again, I also did this as a standalone system, which I really don't know of anyone else who did that as well. Uh, I started in modern army, so I didn't start somewhere else. But, you know, because of my Western mindset, I, I had different conversations with the professor. And, and once I realized I started getting more and more exposed to Filipino culture because huge, huge group up in Toronto and I'd hang out there quite a bit and it started giving me insight on how to talk to the professor and different things. And, you know, when I go to the Philippines now, it's more of a search of cultural um, than it is material. And I feel that right now I know professor better than I've ever known him in the past, or I understand him better than I've ever known him in the past. Um, Hey, Greg, hope you're doing well. Um, so when I when I first put this up there, I had a Filipino from the islands actually challenge me. So we well, should try, if you think your niece is better, um, you know, 
and I and well, to be honest with you, I do, but I'm not thinking combatively speaking per se. But let's talk about combat. What are you doing? Are you teaching Filipino martial arts as an art, or are you teaching as defensive tactics or or sport or a combination thereof? I. Uh, In all the martial arts, I think there's a lot of fantasy stuff going on there. Um, I think there's a lot of things that we think would work. But let's think about this. Uh, okay, I've been doing Balintwak for over 20 years. What's Balintwak? It's the art of stick dueling, one stick fighter against another. Okay, like fencing, one fencer against the other. Now, one time, knowing these skill sets were very important and practical. But we live in the United States, if we're Americanized even in the Philippines. We filmed, okay, so uh, Empty Mind, Empty Mind uh, Films did a documentary, and I think they did a great job. It's, it's my favorite out there so far. And I'm biased because, well, I'm in it. <laughs> but um, it's, it was a what it was. If you ever seen Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, it was Tim and the Entourage trip to the Philippines, and they just basically followed us around everywhere we were. Um, you got to see a bunch of good martial arts um, from all over the place, and um, I'm going to put it up here for you right now. So. Um, so let's see here. Uh, I don't get a portion of the proceeds, which I'm bummed out about, but <laughs> it is what it is. Okay. So um, so if you go to Empty Mind Films, Fighting Arts of Arnis. If you actually look at the spine, it says Fighting Arts of Modern Arnis because that's originally what it was called. Um, I'm going to try something. I don't know if I haven't. I'm new to this software, so I did it wrong the other day. So um, what I'm going to do is see. Actually, I'm going to unshare. I'm going to share it again. Share screen. Uh, so let's see, share the audio. Probably should have uh, looked at something else before I did this. Darn it. Um, hmm. <laughs> yep. I uh, will do a Chrome tab. And we'll do this. Ah, oh, look at the, oh, man, I'm getting, okay, hopefully you guys can hear this once I play this, so. And if you can, please chime in. Strike! Upward, zero, banda, zero, sungkit! Uh, mostly of the students already, they are already involved in Arnis. And some of my students, they're all uh, beginners. That's why I'm just trying to tell them uh, what technique you learn, you try to repeat many times, you know. And good reverse it and then strike! It's complete martial art. You can use double stick, single stick, espada e dagger, desert and dagger, knife, empty hand, anything in your hand is a weapon. You try to move your feet back, back, back. There you are. Good. So here we are in uh, Cebu, and here we are at Balintwak Street. And this is really cool for me because uh, this is the birthplace of one of the systems I train. Uh, you know, one of the last systems Remy Prasis did before forming Modern East was Balintwak Escrima. And this is the birthplace, being the mecca for what we do. Balintwak mainly. We train it for self-defense. Step up. 
defense, defense, react quick, reflex, flexibility, because that is most important. To hit somebody's feet, think how to counter the next to the next to the next. Yeah, there's a, there's always a counter to counter. We are specializing the single stick style. So our aim is to disarm our opponent. So we have to develop counter to counter in disarming. The student knows already. So he knows he knows that every time I strike him, he knows. so that's why I have to do the random. I have fire shooter, I have to hit him. So he'll strike. Uh, I used to watch with me and my friend, very close friend, uh, Grandmaster Nick Elizar. Same here, bam, bam, boom. This is inside, inside. And here comes Grandmaster Bobby Tamimina. I was impressed with Bobby Tamimina while they're doing it because I don't know about that stick fighting before. But it's close range. I like it because it's just like boxing. So that is why I, I came to Balinto. So that's what I learned a lot. Accepting the pain. The reality that you learn from the Philippines. I said, well, I will teach you that, but are you ready to accept the pain? Okay, so that was uh, by Empty Mind Films. They reached out to me before one of the previous trips. A lot, the film, the, the footage at the end was at the uh, FMA Festival. So what happened is uh, we landed, at, we got our hotel in Manila, and John, who's who owns Empty Minds, was waiting for us. Plane was really late, hopped in, and Ronnie Royce was there. So uh, we started our training then. Uh, the film is not in the chronological order, but we, you got to see his his version of Panatuk and stuff there. We went to, um, we were at the... Uh, so I know Fred said he uh, he remembered uh, when he was there. So uh, we, you know, they saw our hotel, which I'm not sure what's going on with it right now. Uh, we'll see what's happening when I go back uh, after uh, after COVID. Um, you know, and uh, so we did that. Then we went to um, a shopping center where there's a Filipino supply company there. We shot over to uh, IKF, the International Kuntao Federation headquarters. The show is working out there with uh, Grandmaster um, uh, Grandmaster Lenata. Uh, I don't care. Someone call me, and I'll call them back when I'm done. Um, we flew to uh, Cebu. There we go. And and uh, we're on Balintawak Walk Streets in Cebu. And uh, we went there, hung around there for uh, like two days, drove down, um, went to Dumiguete, which is on Negros. We dropped John off at the festival, and then a bunch of us went up to to uh, the Preces Resort and um, hung out with Roberto Preces, as we usually do, and visited the graves of Remy and Ernesto. And I didn't want John to be part of that. Um, that was a personal thing. And for the documentary, he'd get to see all these instructors, because a lot of Filipino instructors at the festival. Um, then we came back and we continued there. Then we ended up going to um, Lynetta Park and, and did training there uh, with uh, Rodel de Guck. We also went and visited our niece village, which is also uh, Rodel de Guck in the. Uh, um, um, boom, 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 hit the link button. Okay. Um, what you would call it? Uh, I'll put this here in case I read that right here. I'm going to put the link for people who want it. 
Oops, put too much stuff there. And you mind films has a lot of has a huge library. There we go, huge library stuff. Um, so, um, we went to our niece village, and then you know we called it a day. So it was like a twelve day trip. Um, good time, really fun. I, I, if you're thinking about going to the Philippines, and of course I had an error, so the link isn't going to be showing up a lot on my Facebook pages. Which whatever, I'm not worried about that. Um, so. Um, but it's important to see what's, what's another thing that's different than American Philipp uh, Americanized FMA versus the Philippine martial arts or in the Philippines. I'll tell you what. Oh yeah. Batangas. Our new village is in Batangas. Yes, it is. Um, I'm on cold medicine. I got, I got hay fever. So my head's a little, I'm a little dopier than normal because I know someone's going to make a smart aleck comment there. Uh, we also went to her own belly song shop. So that was another place. Uh, you're welcome, Chris. So, um, so uh, highly recommend if you want to get an idea, a vibe there. Now, here's the thing. The thing that, another thing that separates us from them is that most of them are training outdoors one day a week. Um, if they go, it's like a two to three hour training session. So that's a lot if they go, which they may miss. I only know of two dedicated schools over there. The first one is um, the Dose Paras headquarters, which I have not made it to yet. Uh, just each time I'm in Cebu, I just didn't have time to do that. Um, and uh, Arnis Village, which is, I don't know if I want to. So Riddell de Guck has his own place. And it's Arnis Village, which is producing his sticks. He also has a training area there. So when people come in from out of town, but he teaches mostly, to my knowledge, in the park. I don't know how many instructions and, and classes go on at Arnie's Village itself, other than people who are staying, um, staying with him for periods of time. Now, I will say this. His commitment to extending the craft is phenomenal. He gets up. He's in Batangas. It's, three, it's six hours round trip to teach the people in Lynetta Park. I mean, talk about commitment to keep the craft going. Um, you know, my hat's off to him. You know, he's, he's amazing. I love him. I love him a lot. I mean, so he's spending more time traveling than teaching, you know, um, in his own country now. Um, but the training over there is all done outdoors, except for those two places. And there may be, there may be a small handful of places out over there, but it's a small handful. It's, it's the, it's the exception, not the norm. And people are always training somewhere else temporarily until they lose their spot. And then they go to another place and then they lose their spot again. And they go to, because Rid Riddell has trained all over the place, you know, and has moved to different parts of Lynetta Park and stuff like that. So, um, you know, where here, I have a 5,000 square foot facility that is dedicated to teaching Filipino martial arts. Yes, there's a karate sign on my window or on my on my uh, above the banner of the the building because people don't know what our niece is or Eskrima. Uh I could put in martial arts, but I'd have to get a brand new sign because the sign is only so large. Well, it's bigger than this. But if I do martial arts, that means there's more letters, and the font ha font has to shrink to fit in there. Right now, if it says karate, it's only six letters. It's easier to see, and even in the states. Taekwondo schools put the word karate up when karate was more popular uh, than Taekwondo, you know? So, um, but having, having a dedicated facility, having a written curriculum, having technology that they don't have, um, you know, I have air conditioning, I've got heating, I can turn, I, you know, so there's no excuses. I mean, okay, in Buffalo, we have one excuse. It's a little thing called snow. Sometimes there's a travel ban, but most of the people make it in anyways. You know, two feet of snow, we don't care. Three feet, they start looking. And we got you know, it all depends on what's going on. You know, once we hit four feet, we're off the roads. And it still may drop, and we still may make it in because usually the snow drops overnight, schools are closed, and then by the afternoon, the streets are open again. So who knows? We might be here. You don't have that in the Philippines. You know, if it rains, you're not training. You know, if it's, if it's raining that hard and you don't have an over, over, um, overhang of some sort, um, 
Yeah, it is kind of interesting. We also don't do the video review that we, you know, I mean, my school. Let me see here. Yep. Yep, 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 yep. Yep, yep, exactly, exactly. Having that dedicated people. So, like, I have technology that you, you that the Philippines don't have. I've got a big screen television on my wall with a, uh, a 4K camera. Actually, we're using. I've got another camera here in my office, 4K camera there, to do all this streaming and stuff. Um, I do hybrid classes, so people come in physically, and if they can't make it in, whether they've been exposed or just as a schedule issue, they can log in and attend the class virtually. I have probably 10 virtual students right now from other states and countries, you know, doing my regular classes. So once again, if people are just doing training, I have seven adult classes to choose from at the moment, uh, eight soon. I do a class, two classes at noon on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and then the rest of my classes are Monday through Thursdays at 7 p.m., and then we have a Saturday class at uh, 11 in the morning. I doubt very much in the park that they have people that are logging in for classes. Now, I'm not saying they haven't done virtual classes, Zoom classes, and stuff like that, because I know they have, but they don't. You know, that's not their norm. They're just adapting to the situation. I'm going to keep this going on. I mean, I'm I'm, I'm doing seminars where I'll have, you know, six people show up, but I'll have 30 participants because another 24 people logged in online from all different parts of the world. Um, these are the things from this Americanized format. Also, I think, and we started talking before I get sidetracked on that, um, practical martial arts. I don't think most of the things that people are teaching are uh, very practical as a whole. Uh, we teach the Filipino martial arts. There's a lot of things that don't deal with things that you deal in the streets. During filming of that of that uh, documentary, we were coming back from Lynetta Park, and we sent the film crew back crew back to the hotel, and we walked back. And um, lo and behold, a street fight broke out. Um, so um, the, the street fight broke out. There was probably 20, 30 people there. No one was doing this kung fu fighting stuff here we are a mile from lanata park mecca for filipino martial arts people were swinging bricks throwing stones no one was doing fma there were a bunch of filipinos jumping in combat and we just kept walking because we didn't want to be part of that um you know but I mean, it was a, a an awakening because I was looking at them like, "Holy cow, uh, that guy is swinging a brick! How the heck are we going to deal with that?" Over here, we're bigger people. We're wearing more clothing. We have heavier weapons. So, you know, when we I'm going to use my light here. So, you know, when Professor first taught, he did a lot of unbrace blocking. When he taught in the school systems, he did the brace because the kids didn't have the grip strength. So he modified it. Over here, we'll do some dos manos because when someone's swinging an axe handle at you, which we use in class periodically, most people are not going to have the skill set to block this one-handed. Now, I'm not saying people can't do that. I'm saying the masses can't do that. And if you're teaching the masses versus personal training, you need you have a responsibility of teaching people what's within their skill set if they're coming for you to learn self-protection. As I swing this people, stick the thing at people. Um and, you know, the other thing I see with the Americanized versus the Filipino version, we're already sold. Over here, we're already in. People are training with some over there. Over there, they're all trying to recruit the next person to train underneath them, i.e. the next American or European. I've gone over there um, first time. I didn't tell. I just said, oh, my name's Tim. A few people knew me ahead of time. There's definitely people who knew who I was. Um, but I was in Lynetta Park. No one knew who I was. I was just talking. Yeah, my name's Tim. Okay. And, you know, well, someone will ask, hey, let's all do a photo together. So they'll want to do a photo with the Americans, and they have these little manila envelopes, so they put all the photos of all the people they trained. 
Well, you know, my photo is going to end up in there when they never trained me because they uh, they just did a group photo. Well, fortunately, that time their camera died. I'm the one with the group photo, so it doesn't matter. But I've seen them do it. I've seen them pull out all these things. Oh, look, to validate themselves. If you're good, you don't need to validate. Your validation is going on the mats and teaching and training. And Here, let me show you some stuff. You know, Do you know Datu Dieter? Yeah, I know Datu Dieter. Never telling them that I'm Datu Tim. They don't need to know that. Now, I've been there enough times, they all know who I am. Um, in the park, that is. You know? Um, but I wanted, you know, I wanted people to to tell them, who, tell me who they were without knowing who I was. And I wanted to hear what they had to say. So, um, let's see. Sir, I trained as a foreigner in Dose Paris Multi-Style, HQ and Cebu. Okay. It's a really commercial gym. It was, uh, as we understand the U.S., uh, except for the fact that the structure of the gym was that outdoor parking, flat levels, there was no air con. Okay. Uh, do you have a pu They do have puzzle mats in the. Yep. So that was not the norm. That was the exception, I would say. Um, you know, Dose Partners headquarters has turned it into a business. You know, they, they're very good at what they're doing over there, you know. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, so, but, I mean, you know, for the most part, people are training outside. They don't have mats. They're the My Baja Zubu friends over here, uh, they, they train with Master Yuli, and they have a, um, their uniforms for a the tournament that we went to, they did it as basketball. And I go, you know, um, and I'm like, okay. Here we had to throw back to our uh, our teacher. I go, why is that? Well, we train on a basketball court. I'm like, okay, that's cool. You know, paying a little homage to the environment. Um, and Filipinos do like basketball over there. It is it's something they enjoy doing. Um, so, you know, I, I look at what we do and I try to figure out the needs for my people. And, you know, if you're just doing martial arts, you're not trying to do combatives. It doesn't matter what you're taught. But I think a lot of times what we do is being here in the States is we modify it for our personal needs more so than I would see Filipinos do that. I mean, the Filipinos do it for their needs. They teach it in the Philippines. But, um, you know, there is a lack of linguistics um, and the words are inconsistent from one group to another. And I don't know how much of that is systematic identity versus lack of education. Um, no written curriculum. And I mean, listen, when I have my written curriculum, it's a guideline. I still deviate from it, but it's, it's, it's a journey I'm on. And I don't stick so, so hard. I'm not so steadfast with that, that I can't deviate. I mean, you need to be able to, to flow with things. Um, but there are definitely differences. You know, when I, when I look at the Germans doing it, the DAV, they're definitely different than we are. They have their own body mechanics, their own way of doing things. Uh, it's not what I would do. And it's not what I do. It's not bad. It's just the way they were brought up and the way they do things. That's all, you know. Um, I have my own group because I do things a different way. Let's see. Coming up on 25 years of FMA for myself. Amazing journey and instructors. Thank you for your show. Oh, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Okay, so um, I was a little, I'm a little off today because of all the last minute stuff and the headaches I had to deal with with certain things being dropped on my lap as I was coming in here. Uh, and I still have to fix things, but hey, it is what it is. Um, does anyone have any questions on anything uh, or statements? I mean, um, you know, my thing is that I think what we do is different. When you transplant a system, it's going to be different from that point on. Um, yep. Thank you, Jeff. Um, you know, um, what, you know, like I said, we, we, we do things differently over here. We have a different environment and we have different needs, 
you know, and a lot of times people come to martial arts because they need focus and control and focus in their life. Uh, some of the people come in for social interaction, uh, some people to lose weight, others to protect themselves. I mean, I want to offer all these things to my people, uh, realizing that not everyone's here for the same thing. Um, and I also, but the big thing for me is that if their push comes to shove, that the stuff that I, <laughs> oh God, we'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, Thoughts on great grandmasters. You mean the title of GGM? Um, I'll let Romeo comment on that real quick. If you're asking me whether I think the GGM title should stay, well, I will make a comment on that. Um, so um, <laughs> I'm just thinking of that one. That's a funny one. Yep, LOL. Thanks, Romeo. Uh, you suck. You really suck. Okay, I don't buy. I don't buy the title. Um, we're going to talk about what in the future what does it take to be a grandmaster and all this other stuff. Um, I think there's just one grandmaster. Simple as that. I think certain things got lost in the translations. As my first trip to the Philippines, and a, fr a friend of mine who is Filipino, was born in the islands, moved to the states. First thing he told me was, "Tim ranks cheap over there." I go, it's cheap everywhere. I go, it's cheaper there than anywhere else. And people don't understand the Western values that we put on Grandmaster. There's a lot of people that walk around with a GM title that I think would be more, more, uh, um, more um, appropriate being masters. There's some people I go see over there that probably shouldn't be teaching at all that goes around as Grandmaster title as well. But some people would say the same thing about me. And that's the right to their opinion. They're wrong, but that's the right. <laughs> uh, no, no, uh, no insecurity here. Um, you know, Remy was the grandmaster, period. End of story. Um, after the grandmaster leaves, only $500? Oh, that's a, that's a pretty good deal. Huh, okay. Um, uh, I might, I might get a piece of that. No, joking, joking, joking. Um, so I, I do use the term grandmaster, and we'll talk about that in the future. But the reason why I'm grandmaster is that Ernesto Price has promoted me, not because I used it on my own. Oh, on sale marketing. Okay, gotcha. Um. You know, so, but we're going to talk about what it takes to be a grandmaster and all this other stuff because I, I do have issues with some things out there, people walking around and, you know, based on some people going with 10th degree black belts, I think I should probably be wearing a 15th based on what I'm seeing out there, even above Master Ken. We're talking Master Ken from Ameridote, by the way, who is a funny guy and I've known him from Marshall Talk days when I helped co-create that. Okay, everybody. Um... I hope everyone had a good time. So is, is Americanized FMA better than the Filipino version? It's better for us. That's the thing. Um, is it better overall? Mm, that's something you got to figure out for yourself. Um, but next week we're going to go over, wait for it, whether or not you need to go to the Philippines. Next week's thing is, uh, is, um, is it a, uh, whatchamacallit, a uh, waste of time and money? Or is it a, uh, a necessity, a training necessity? Now, this weekend, we will not, this Friday, there will not be a uh, FMA professional. I am uh, doing our camp. Now, if anyone's interested in participating, we still have uh, virtual and physical tickets available um, if you go to the, uh, let me see, I'm going to pull this up right now. Ah, son of a gun. I'm going to hit the button. Um, that didn't work out right. If you go to dot2hartman.com. You have a bunch of our up and coming events and um, so um, right here 
You just go to drartmangat.com, go to uh, events versus distance learning, although we have that. So you can click on, um, well, I'll get wrong one. Click on that, and it takes you right in here, and you can sign up right there. Now, the um, uh, class starts Friday at 9 a.m. There's a pre-conference on uh, um, on um, Thursday. We start at noon, go to whenever. Um Okay, and then um, if anyone's interested in distance learning, I have two uh, two options here. So one is the um, on-demand lessons where you can purchase the on-demand classes for the Modern East University. And then we have our hybrid learning class, which some I, evidently some of my plugins are not working at the moment because my pictures are gone. And we have membership where you can do one class a week, um, unlimited for the month, so if it's one class a week, it's $79 a month. If it is up to, you can go unlimited is 125 a month, which is uh, Monday through Thursday at 7, Tuesdays and Thursdays at uh, noon, and most Saturdays at 11. And then if you if you want, you can do a prepay where you pay for the quarter, and it's $299. There's a fairly decent savings on that. So, um, and that being said, we'll, we'll turn we'll stop doing that there all right so that's if anyone's interested in getting on board with that just let me know um yes and uh pretty sure that master ken would call it all bullshit you're right you're right i'm glad uh okay so then there and then what's this one uh i can speak as a name okay pros and cons of okay so next week we're back to our normal time which will be 11 a.m uh, next monday and we're going to talk about um, training in the Philippines, whether or not that is a necessity or if it is a, um, a waste of time and effort. I have my opinion on it. Um, but let me just tell you this. I'm going. I'll continue to go, but not for the reasons that most people are thinking about. Okay, so everybody, uh, please, if you once again, if you get a chance, go over to our YouTube channel, um, like the video, subscribe to the channel, hit that notification button, and please feel free to share this anywhere you want. I will be doing a wrap-up video, which will probably be out in a day or two, just like last week we did with the uh, with the uh, black belt certification. I don't know if it'll be out this week. Um, I'm getting ready for our training camp, but I will have that out there. Okay, everybody, uh, as always, please stay safe and stay sane. I want to thank everyone for tuning in uh, for this episode of Dotsu's Corner. And um, and that's about it. So please, everybody, stay safe, stay sane, and I'll see you soon.